big voice. All right. Yeah, okay. I have a big voice anyway. But um, we have been talking more nuts and bolts you know, over the last day, day and a half, more or less, and hearing about some really exciting new things this morning. Um, but today we get to talk a little bit more about some of the possibilities. And we have a wonderful example of the possibilities of participation in Scenic and the Cal Run Network with us today. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Mount Allen of SF Jazz. And he's going to talk to you about a really, really exciting program that was made possible by high bandwidth. So, Mount? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Good. We're still in morning. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Um, so, I'm Mount Allen. I'm the Director of Operations for the San Francisco Jazz Organization. We call it SF Jazz. And uh, we opened our building about three years ago with one, several focuses, one of which was to ensure that we had the ability to go beyond the 700 seats that we have in our facility um, because we want to spread the word of jazz across the globe. And so in that effort, uh, we have a really great partner, and that partner is Scenic, um, which now we have you as a partner as well because as a result, we are now peering partners. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you a bit about uh, the relationship we have with Scenic and the relationship that we're developing with the libraries. And uh, it, in a more casual nature, and I'd certainly welcome, please feel free to interject at any time, any questions that you may have. Um, now, on so much on the technical side, I may not be able to help you because I'm not quite sure, you know, I'm not quite sure all of those considerations in terms of what you've got going on, but programmatically, uh, in terms of concepts and ideas, I might be able to be of some assistance, okay? So just to give you some idea of, of our approach, in particular SF Jazz, I have this, this slide which is called Opening Portals to the World of Jazz. And it kind of breaks down our approach to the network in that it recognizes we have basically four primary programs that we use um, to, to use the network as a vehicle for outreach and participation. Um, the one we'll speak of in particular today is the one we call Exchanges from the Stage. Uh, and what that does is that, has, that gives the opportunity for SF Jazz to reach out to venues across the country, across the world, and particularly across the state of California, and um, have conversations between our artists and the audiences that are there. Because we truly believe that you know, jazz is a very interactive kind of activity, and to giving people the op opportunity to, uh, to exchange with artists creates greater engagement of the arts, and especially with youth, the opportunity to get them in moving, get them involved earlier. Um, so we have a model. The, our model basically states we see the duality of the network in that it has, as, as you probably are aware, it has what we call a commodity or commercial internet component, and it also has that research education network component that provides, uh, provides other opportunities to do lots of fun things. Um, so this is you know, the beginning of the education continuum. So this is where it started for me and, and my family, right at the main Detroit Public Library branch. I mean, this was really the point where formal education Became, became a part of our lives. And I contend that, that that's not different in communities across the country. So the opportunity that we have, that you have, to engage with education um, through the public libraries is just such a, a collaborative opportunity that, uh, that you should all be like very, very thrilled to be a part of this, and I'm sure you are. Um, so, okay, you're connected, so what happens next? Well, the, one of the things that they're talking about quite a bit here uh, during this conference is the Pacific Research Platform Goal. And that states that this, you know, the scientific, prog well, ESNet stated, the scientific 
progress, complete, scientific progress completely unconstrained by the physical location of instruments, people, computational resources, resources and data. And you know, I saw that and it so, so engaged me because as I thought of you know, what we're really up to at, S at SF Jazz, it's basically the exact same thing. Uh, we say it just slightly different. You know, we, our goal, we, we've created virtual marginalization of distance. And that's the result of minimizing the impact of perceived distance within communication cycles by the use of advanced networking technology and the establishment of BA. So BA is something uh, I spoke of last year at this conference where it's about the creation of virtual communities. Um, that, so we're no longer constrained by bricks and mortar in terms of how we actually interact with each other. Um, and our ability to marginalize distance as we interact uh, with universities, with uh, institutions such as the libraries, um, kind of more humanizes the opportunities that are available on the network. We're, we're strong supporters of that. Um, and you know, this this is our community now, and we can mix and match this any, any way we see fit. The opportunity for collaboration and partnership is no longer constrained by these things. So this is a, this, I borrowed this from, from Lewis, uh, Lewis Fox, a, a presentation he's done recently talking about the peering relationships just you know, throughout, the, throughout the globe. Um, so consider yourself now a part of this global network where if there are libraries or institutions that are playing this game, you now can create games that uh, bring you into this and, and allow these, these, uh, these points of contact to be collaboration points for you. So let's talk specifically about programs. We engaged the Peninsula Library in a conversation about having our performance show up in their facilities. And this is a new concept, so it took quite a bit to actually have it happen, and, and we engaged them because they, in, in recognition that it might take something to make this happen, and so we did this kind of back and forth iterative Let's, let's call it agile approach to how we actually put this together. And this is one of the pieces that uh, was created by, I think it was uh, the San Mateo Public Library in promoting what we were going to do. And I'm gonna show you a, a couple, I'll show you some video in, in a few minutes in terms of how, uh, how this uh, performance actually took place. But we engaged one of our partners uh, that if you're around later today, you'll also have the opportunity to experience uh, a company called UltraGrid. And what they do is they provide incredible, incredibly low latency video conferencing uh, opportunities uh, to our community. You really, to optimize, the, uh, to optimize the use of it, you really do need a certain amount of bandwidth to make that happen. So the folks from UltraGrid uh, worked with us uh, in connecting three of the libraries on the peninsula to uh, host a performance where we have a program called, called Family Matinees take place maybe once or once, once a month or once every six weeks where we invite the public on a Saturday to come into the building and fill up our 700 seats. And the demand for the program has grown su such that you know, we actually either need to start doing more of them or find other ways to get that word out. And this has been what we've done. So this was a pilot that we worked. So what I'm saying is that we, a lot of the programs or all of the programs that we create around this are based on existing programs that exist with, within our uh, programming structure. So uh, we, they're like add-ons. Um, how it actually worked, and here's kind of like a schematic. We, the San Francisco Jazz Center had a, had a performance of the SF Jazz Collective, which is our, our, our presented group. And we connected through Scenic to Belmont, East Palo Alto, and Redwood City. 
And as you see, the arrows are going in both directions. So the first portion of the event was us providing um, high definition uh, video and audio to the libraries. And then when the performance was all done, we asked each of those sites to um, take some of their community members and engage our artists from the stage. So we had a template of, the, of each of the locations that was posted, uh, that was projected on, on a big screen at SF Jazz. So everyone could see everyone else and so we could see all of them. So all of the folks at SF Jazz could see all of the folks at the libraries. The libraries could see all of the folks at SF Jazz. And so we're, just, we're trying to create a sense of community in, in that whole concept of, of reducing or marginalizing distance in, uh, in terms of pres the presentation of art. And we did a similar program um, just a few weeks after that on a smaller scale where we had the opportunity to work with uh, the San Francisco Main Public Library in an incredible space that they have called The Mix. And I do believe, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this is your community, I do believe that the San Francisco Public Library w was the first 10 gig library in the network. Um, so in that regard, they, they can play a really huge game, and, and they're stepping out to do some very exciting things as well. They have a space called The Mix, where they're doing lots of digital, uh, digital interaction and what have you. So after our family matinees, what we normally do to create more of an interactive element is we have a small workshop. Um, it's, we can only fit about uh, 50 people out of that 700, so it's very high in demand. It's first come, first serve, and we end up, unfortunately, turning a lot of people away to maintain the quality of, of the experience. And so we thought, well, how could we create, how could we continue that experience and be able to be more inclusive of some of those folks that couldn't make it? And so we came up with this interactive family matinee workshop where we, co we, where we distributed um, artists to the library into their mix and provided instruments there for the children to work with and we actually did a, a workshop between our site and their site. So now the library is about two blocks from us so when we reach that point of 50 where we could no longer accept any more folks. We encouraged those folks to take a walk a couple of blocks over to the library and still get the experience of interacting with our artists and actually artists that we were providing them in their space. Um, and so, you know, so once again, it's an extension of our existing program. We're looking at, at ways of expanding that and being more inclusive uh, in, in our ability to uh, interact with the community. So the libraries, the San Francisco libraries, the Peninsula libraries have turned out to be really great partners in terms of uh, making these types of things happen. Uh, and this is just a, a real basic schematic of that, that experience. So you notice the big fat arrow that represents all the, 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 the bigness of a 10 gig connection. Uh, we at SF Jazz, we're, we're one gig, but you know, in comparison to our, and to our cultural institution neighbors, um, most of them are less than 100 mega, megs. So their ability to interact on this network is marginalized. And I see an, a, an associate of mine um, from the Exploratorium who've just come on with a gig re recently. So they're doing fun and exciting things as well. So, so Scenic is actually providing a really wonderful opportunity for cultural institutions and education institutions and art institutions to collaborate in this nature. Um, and this is the piece that we use quite a bit. Uh, it's called UltraGrid, and as I mentioned, we'll be using a portion of that, this technology, this evening. If you happen to come back for the uh, interact for, for the interact, yes, quite interactive performance that we'll be hosting at five o'clock today during the reception, um, because. And there will be some slight differences between that and what's, what took place in terms of these items because 
what we're doing tonight has a lot more to do with performance as opposed to just talking. So we're actually going to split out the audio and the video and we'll be using a piece called um, Jack Trip on the audio tonight, but we'll, because of the quality of the video, we'll still use UltraGrid. So let me, let me play a couple of clips for you. I, I'll have to cue them up um, to give you an, a slight feel of what was going on. And uh, once again, willing to take any questions that you might have. It's because we're trying something new. So I want to tell you. Whoops. Something about what we're going to be doing with this performance. First of all, you're not the only audience that's going to be listening to this amazing music. We have. Thanks to the modern technology and our friends at Scenic, which stands for the Corporation for Education Network Initiatives in California, and the Peninsula Library System, we're going to be live broadcasting this show to three libraries down the peninsula. So we're going to be able to see them on this screen. Woohoo! How about that? <laughs> modern technology, folks, it's amazing. This is the first time we're trying this at SF Jazz, so you guys are all part of an amazing experiment. Okay? So, right after the concert, we're going to have students from SF Jazz Center and our three public libraries in the peninsula take turns asking questions of the members of the band. And we'll be so. Okay, so that's one clip. I would like to share another one with you. So here's some of that interactive, this interactive, um, interactive nature. Want to be a musician? Yeah, like when you were young, did you know you wanted to be in a band? No, when I was young, I started playing the uh, this instrument when I was three years old. So I couldn't reach it. I was <laughs> I was really tiny. So, and so a hobby of mine outside of uh, playing music, what I always wanted to be. I don't know if any and your parents let your kids watch, but I always wanted to be a, a WWE superstar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up in the days of, uh, I mean, he's still a wrestler, believe it or not, he's old. Uh, the guy named Hulk Hogan, and I, I, I wanted to be like him, and I don't know if you see these arms. I'm, I'm <laughs> we were wondering I, about that. How I much still hope one day on Vince McMahon will be in here and take me under his wing. <laughs> Thank you, Warren. All right, Redwood City, I think we have somebody there ready to ask a question. Go ahead, this is you. Hi. This is a question for anybody um, going into the music field. So as a child, how did you, how did you feel? You know, we grew up in a very capitalistic society and, and kids want to go to college and get degrees. Did you experience any oppression or condemnation for going into the field that you wanted to go into? And that would be the music field. Wow. Sean is all over this one. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in a very small town in Ohio, Warren, Ohio. It's between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, and it's very blue collar. I was one of the weird kids. Like, why are you doing practicing all day? You know, all that kind of thing. So um, I got to high school and I started practicing more, and I decided that I wanted to be a musician. And there were a lot of people that said, you shouldn't do that. Musicians don't make any money. They're all on drugs, they're all crazy, <laughs> stuff like that. And I said, well, this is what I want to do. It's what I wake up thinking about every single day. When I go to bed at night, it's what I think about. And then someone said, well, you know, in order to make money being a musician, you got to be one of the best. I said, well, I better practice a little bit more then. <laughs> but I never allowed that to deter me from what my dreams were. I didn't think about money, I didn't think about fame or any of that. I just wanted to do what I love to do, and I'm happy to be here doing it. Yes. Um, all right. Max, Max, get it. We're ready for Okay, let me give you another clip.
feel like I'm in a library. It's so cool. <laughs> so this next one is interesting. I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a bit. The question has already been asked, and it's about improvisation. Um, and so the, the artist responded, and then an, another artist will come back and do a, a slight uh, conclusion on that. So that's what that is. You know, let those things go. You might have to <laughs> turn this up just so a all little kinds of things. Right. I wanted to add on to your answer to your question is a great, great question. But uh, impro and people think that, you know, how do people improvise? It's so strange. But everybody in this room improvises every day, all day long. We're all improvising, when we, especially when we speak. We never, you don't, I don't know what you're going to say to me. You don't know what I'm going to say to you. And we just improvise. We just interact in real time. And, and you react to what someone says to you. Like I react to how the, what the drummers may play or what the piano may play. And then I just respond to that. And they respond to me. So everybody in improvises all this day long. It's the most natural thing we do. So it's just not a very mysterious thing. You just have to apply what you do every day into a musical term or right. genre. Thank you, Robin. And then I, I, have, uh, I have another clip for you. But once again, I'm, what I'm pointing to is, you know, the, the, arts are, the arts are beyond the visual and, the, and what you hear. Um, there are opportunities that these, these children are, are learning uh, different perspectives of, about how to approach life. And when we... When we can do that, the arts take on a whole new meaning. Um, you know, the, the whole concept between STEM and STEAM, um, it's been proven that embedding art in folks' lives creates value for them. Uh, and it, it engages them and makes their experiences and lives much more rich. And so the opportunity to reach children at, at a young stage um, and and the value of this particular expression, jazz, um, creates, uh, creates all types of opportunities. And the model that we're looking at in terms of SF jazz, we recognize you know, we're, we're creating the model. You, you figure out in your various communities how it may best work. Maybe it's classical music. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's drumming. Uh, maybe it's dance. It's, I, I like to think of it in terms of um, the approach that we're taking. If, I, I don't know, is, is anyone familiar with the slow food movement? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, in the slow food movement, the thought is, you know, what what do you have right here? What is what is native to your community? What really works, and how how do you nurture that to strengthen your overall community? We're taking the same approach. We're saying, you know, within our industry, what really what really it's for us that's jazz, and we'll take that and we'll overlay that and give you opportunities to see. Uh, to see the, the particular value of, of th this indigenous art form and, and how it can bring value to communities across the globe. Um, and then this last clip, and, and then once again, I'm, I'm happy to take, take uh, any questions that you might have. This last clip is, is, speaks to the, um, the connection that the artist can make and the impression that art can make in young folks' lives. I remember once being in a small club in Oakland, California. It's closed now. Uh, well, it's actually relocated now. It's called Yoshi's. And uh, there is a, a gentleman by the name of um, Bradford Marcellus. And uh, he was playing. And I was so touched by what he was doing on the stage. I said, uh, uh, uh. And he looked over at me, and for the next seven minutes, he riffed all over that little piece. And that impacted me. I mean, he's now one of my favorite artists. You know, I'll, I'll buy everything he has, and I listen to him, and I listen to his recommendations. It's that exchange that creates the opportunity for expansion. Um, so see if you see the possibility here. All right.
we have three last questions. One from Belmont. Go ahead, Belmont. Do you know how to play Oye Como Va? Do you know how to play Oye Como Va? Dale. Yes. <laughs> So uh, in, in that, you know, I, I think that young man and, and his parents will remember that experience for the rest of his life. And he, if he ends up being in jazz band, you know, um, um, th I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so, so that's it. That's what we're up to. Um, I'm, I open up the floor for questions. Yes. Okay, yeah. so Nathan from Kalinga, one comment, super cool. And the other, uh, the questions are, one, how much bandwidth uh, does it take to do this uh, on either side? And then two, have you, have you ever messed with actually trying to have like maybe an interactive where you have, you know, part of the band in one place, part of the band in the other, and depending on your delay and your stream, if it could actually work, if they could like test together and find out, you know, if that was possible, and maybe even include some of your remote locations, like the kids at the library, to be able to uh, participate musically with, like one, per like you guys set the beat, and then once they hear the beat, then they're able to, you know, add to it. And I just think that I, I think your whole thing is really, really nice. So thank you, yeah. thank you, Nathan. So to answer your question, yes. Uh, matter of fact, if you stick around tonight at five o'clock, we're doing that exact thing. Um, uh, we're at, we have three sites where we will actually host a concert mm -hmm. and we will be the site that is uh, where the music music director is and she's kind of coordinating uh, this activity um, and then on, on a more communal scale you know one one of the earlier slides where um, if I can Sorry. Let's go back to this one. So that program, Auditions and Admissions, um, that speaks to the opportunity to um, link communities across the country with actually a focus on having, having um, artistic expertise that's located, whether they be at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Berkeley School of Music, um, and have them work with kids that are interested in the possibility of music as a career. So working with them to get them in the pipeline to help them uh, get into school. So we're, we're and, and that's a very interactive program. Uh, and in, in that case, we would use slightly different technology. Uh, and that technology does require higher bandwidth. But, um, but to my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, most, most of your institutions will have one, one gig service. So that's a great place to start. I, and I guarantee you, you'll get there and you'll want more, but you'll certainly, certainly that's a wonderful place to start. And uh, does that pretty much answer your question? Great, thanks. That's great, so, so exciting. I wanted to speak to something that you were saying about the Branford Marsalis experience that you had. Um, and that's that, you know, when you're in a small club and listening to jazz, you, you feel such intimacy with the, it, you're not just listening to music, you're watching how they interact with each other, sort of the subcurrent of communication mm -hmm. and the mm, mm you know, kind of thing. I'm just wondering, how do you create that outside of the room? Do you have to have different camera angles or it, it seems like it would be actually very hard to create intimacy with your remote locations. That's great. So. Um 
So a part, one reason that we feel, that I feel, that we feel that jazz is so essential to this technology is because of those things. Um, you know, there is a communication etiquette around jazz. There's like an exchange that takes place and where it, where it leaves into the metaphysical, it's, I can't say because I'm not a musician, but there's something going on there that's very essential to making that groove, right? And so that happens at exploration, innovation, and refinement, where we're trying to work with the network work with those that are writing applications on the network and allowing them to work with jazz because I truly believe that if it works with jazz, it'll work anywhere. So tonight, for instance, this, what we're doing at five o'clock, it's never been done. And, you know, this is a very forgiving community in the sense of we can have fun. And so if it doesn't work exactly uh, as it's to be, as it is to be, then fine. And you know, um, Chris, one of my one of my colleagues over here, had had told me the CEO, this gentleman by the name of Lewis Fox, tells her, "Fail." How did you say it, Chris? Fail better. Fail better. And so you know, that's what we're up to. That's what we're, right. So we press the limits, we press the edge, and we've identified at least at SF Jazz a, a segment of how we approach this in our model to make sure that we can fail as, as frequently and as well as we possibly can. So that's okay. Hi, Natalie Van Osdell from uh, Cinegrid and also Pacific Interface. Hey, um, Natalie. Hi, Lou, hi. Uh, to your comment, I think, you know, something that comes to mind is that you know, the more successful we are in these experiments of collaboration over networks, the more driven designers will be to incorporate that. So all of you with your libraries, you're trying to figure out how, a, how an auditorium can be a jazz club, you know, emulate a jazz club, and probably not on this generation of libraries. But I think what these kind of experiments do is push the limits of actual physical design too. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the next generation of libraries, there is a cushy room with a really, you know, uh, distilled Meyer constellation system so that that's part of the, what a library can deliver. And to the previous guy's comments, um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to call him Guy, I just don't know what his name is. Nathan. Um, I think a few years ago at Cinegrid, we showed the results of an experiment between USC and Skywalker Sound that brings to mind kind of what you're talking about. And that was a master class for graduate students at USC who wanted to become music producers. And our colleagues at Skywalker Sound were mentors to them for a period of time. And kind of some of the things you're talking about, Lewis, in the availability of the libraries as venues, you know, brings to mind an expansion of that kind of concept, too. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, so how are the, the artists, the musicians, responding to this concept? That's, that's a great question. Um, I think different ways. Uh, I think um, holistically, altruistically, the opportunity to have jazz a part of communities that it would not normally be a part of is a very, very enrolling consideration for them. Um, quite frankly, you know, the artists that I know, as they come through the center, the SF Jazz Center, and as, you know, the, depending on how you work the statistics, right now we're the, the largest presenters of jazz in the country. Uh, many of them actually ask, where are the opportunities for our educational engagement? Um, they ask, and, and that is often done um, pro bono at times. And I, I'll, quite frankly, the, the educational engagement on the artistic side that's taking place today is pro bono, um, just because the artist feels strongly about what we're doing and has donated her time uh, to be here. So, um, and quite frankly, the artists in the other two locations as well. 
um, at, and we are engaging the New World Symphony and, and actually San Francisco Jazz. So, so that's that's my. There's some there's some other issues in terms of of uh, distribution and what have you. And do we create a what, what's the pain model for these things? And we're working through them. But from where we stand, you know, if if what we're really up to and what we're really about is creating the opportunity to have this music exist uh, on a larger scale. So in the next 20 years, you know, jazz shows up like in, in a much bigger space with much bigger uh, um, audiences, then it's certainly worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Nicole. Hey, hi, Matt. Hi. Um, I'm Nicole from the Exploratorium. I just had a question about the two-way in terms of the libraries or classrooms or are the are they are the artists seeing the audiences in their remote locations? Yes. Okay. And have you guys tried any? Um, I was curious just about like because kids use it so much social media in terms of either using that as a secondary question, you know, question model or some other kind of interactivity in that realm. In a limited sense, right now. Um, you know, we internally we're, we're active in social media during the times that these are going on, and so we do have some back and forth. But as like an established platform, um, that's probably next on our list of how to engage. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Natalie Renter, and I'm the library director for the Kings County Library. And my colleague is Nathan, and we're kind of connected in that Central Valley zone. So my, I want to make speak to the one lady's comment about how can we create spaces? We can't, I, I, you know, I know new buildings are wonderful, but it'll take us forever to get that. So anyway, for me, it would be how can I quickly transform my library space for my community to experience as far as maybe doing some prep work, some mm -hmm. en enrichment activities mm -hmm. to get them prepared for the event that will be coming you know, through the technology. So that was just my comment. But my question is, yes. do you have any connections in the Central Valley area as far as jazz groups that well, we could call outside of your organization? <laughs> um, <laughs> Interesting, you know, I, I, I spent about 10 years in Modesto, so, oh, I, <laughs> um, and you know, the Brubeck Institute is, is right there in Stockton. Um, ironically, they're not, they're not on the network, so, you know, this is a plug that it would be really great to have them a part of the network. Um, you know, we have a we have a huge database, uh, SF Jazz has a huge database of artists across the Across the globe. So, if you're looking for um, if you're looking for artists to be in your area, just let's let's have a conversation about it. But I would also say on, on the on, around your comment that you know what's what's taking place next door, it it, it was it was pretty much all brought in. Um, there there's of course the, the the conference center has an infrastructure for sound and light, but at this level. You know, we're bringing in the mixers, we're bringing in the PA, and, and fact be told, the Scenic has brought in the network to do this. So, you know, they're, they're not just outfitting libraries, they're willing to outfit um, convention centers and, and things like that that are on college campuses. So, so there's some opportunities. We can, the, the quality of the transmission, if you are Scenic connected, it's so easy to reinforce that with quality sound, quality video. You can rent it, and we've done that on some occasions. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions? Because we're getting close to the close to the end. I'm Doug Mason from the Buena Park Library District out in Southern California. And this really isn't a question; it's just a comment about the presentation, which I thought was awesome. Thank you. Um, I walked into the room thinking this is all just kind of fantastical, you know, especially being a jazz lover and in my community I don't see that very much, but um, all that was beside the point. I, I was thinking this was kind of outside the realm of possibility, but the one little scene in this whole thing that drove it home to me, that connected, was that one scene of the library. I th it looked like a small auditorium it's like ours, and it had the book truck with a caution tape on it. <laughs> 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 and, 
And then it hit. It said, right. this does work. Right. And I just want to thank you for that. I think the way you did this, you know, without things like that, it wouldn't have connected. Great. Well, yeah. thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Maybe just one more if anybody has a question. If not, um, thank you, Mount. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> oh. um, I, one one yeah. further comment. Yeah. So um, just to departing, there's a, there's a possibility that um, if you are presently connected on Scenic, um, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of doing a stream to, of a family matinee in May. And if you're, if you're connected and you're interested, please send me a note and we'll see what might be possible. We still have plenty of time to, um, to facilitate that opportunity. Uh, and I, I can give you all, matter of fact, you can look it up on the website. It's the first week in May. If it looks like something interesting to you, uh, let's, let's connect and maybe we can create a little pilot program and, and stream some music directly to your site. Uh, I, I'm sorry, what time of day is it? I think it starts at, um, at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. It's on a Saturday. And it totally slips me right now who it is, but uh, but it's it's supposed to be a pretty big name, so so um, that's it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Ah. Daniel Handler, it's Daniel Handler. Yeah.